we are the hands and the feet of Jesus, man. We're all called to do his, his work. And this is how we got to edify each other and love on each other and lift each other up. That's the way, that's the way he's designed this thing. I'm a, I need an eyeball and a foot and an arm and, a, and an elbow and a joint and a wrist. We're all working together. Nobody's more important than the other. Welcome to the Christian Music Archive podcast, conversations about Christ, community, and music. I'm your host, Dave Maurer. As I was preparing to start this podcast, I did a lot of research, probably more research than I really needed to do, but I listened to a lot of podcasts. I've heard a lot of great stories and testimonies from several musicians I know and a lot of people who I wasn't familiar with. Now, at this point, I want to give a shout out to Andrew Osinga's podcast, The Pivot. His podcast has probably been the one that put me over the edge knowing that I had to start my own podcast. And he continues to be an inspiration for me to pursue excellence in these conversations. Anyway, one podcast Andrew did, uh, he spoke with a guy named Dennis Parker. Now, as Dennis was sharing his story, I thought, I know this guy. Where do I know him from? So I jumped onto the Christian Music Archive, and sure enough, I've got Dennis's album, The Missing Piece, listed on the page. In fact, I have a copy of that CD right here. He was one of those artists that had a single album, and I've often wondered, what happened to Dennis? But what really held my attention more than the fact that I've listened to Dennis's CD was his story about how God brought Dennis back to a relationship with Jesus. And, and I thought, if I ever get this podcast started, I sure hope Dennis will share his story because I think a lot of us need to hear how the grace of God is a wonderful and amazing gift. So I'm extremely grateful to Dennis for taking the time to sit down and chat with me. Now, he had just had a particularly difficult week with some family issues he's been dealing with, so it was especially meaningful to me that he would take time out of his schedule to share his story. So Dennis, I'm extremely honored to welcome you to the Christian Music Archive podcast. Oh man, I'm, I'm, I'm privileged. Thanks. I, I've, I've gotten to the place where if anybody asks anything of me, uh, it's got to happen because I believe this is, I believe this is of the Lord. God gave you a story to tell. And so you need to tell it, right? God tell it. That's, yeah. that's, uh, that's been pretty much the mandate when I got saved is like, uh, I got two, uh, I got two messages from, a from a pastor and they, and they both have, have spoke really loudly to me hmm. at that very initial state of my commitment. One was, um, it was about Peter walking on water, you know, and, yeah. it's just, and it was basically a sermon was like, he was the only one that got out there, Yeah, you know? Yeah. He's the one that wanted to go out there. And, the, and, and of course, he failed, and, and Jesus pulls him up, puts yep. him back on the boat. And the message was, we're all supposed to be on the water. Hmm. We're supposed, all supposed to be out there. That's, that's where we're supposed, that's where the work is. Uh, but we're going to fail. Yeah. And G at that time, Jesus is going to pick us up and he's going to put us back on the boat. The boat's a time of preparation, but it's not a time to be lazy and just lay there. You're supposed to be preparing so yeah. you can get back out on the water, get back out there. Yeah. And, uh, and the other, other message was, uh, you've got a story to tell Yeah. and only you can tell it. There's people that can tell it for you and yep. they can tell aspects of it. But nobody can tell your story like you, and you know the truth and speak the truth. And what you tell from your heart is is much more powerful than something read off a page, as far as I'm concerned. And nobody can deny your story. Right. They 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 can't do it. They can uh, they can they can interpret it however they want to. They can chalk it up to coincidence, and they can say, well, that's just you know, that's yeah. just that's just by chance. But when you say God in, intervened in my life, the obsession for alcohol left. I was addicted. I could not stop. I know the hell that I lived in. 
I it drove me all the way to to from from here to all the way straight down, and and the love of Christ came. And for some reason, now that obsession is gone. How do you explain that? Yeah. I know exactly what it was. Yeah, it's it's the love of God. It's His mercy. He He took that obsession away from me, that's and that's so cool. It's beautiful. That is so cool. Well, yeah. Well, for the people who are listening who don't know who Dennis is, can we start at the beginning? I mean, you're you you're playing with Ricky Skaggs right now, right? You're in his band. Yeah. And uh, uh -huh. so, uh, and you play pretty much anything that's got strings on it. Well, I was <laughs> I was raised up in uh, in bluegrass music. My dad was a huge bluegrass lover. In fact, he felt like that was the only type of music there was. Okay. Uh, he would listen to some country music, but. He, I, I would wake up every morning to live at Carnegie Hall, oh. Flat and Scrubs, every morning, 6.30 in the morning. It would just, in fact, if I ever find that album out anywhere, I uh, I buy it and burn it so uh, that no one else can have to live through the hell that I had to listen to that, <laughs> that album. I love Flat and Scrubs, don't get me wrong, yeah. but I don't ever want to hear that record again. Oh, he was a he was a quirky guy. Yeah, you know, my dad was in the military. I was born in Fairbanks, Alaska, oh. in 1969. My mother was way more loving than my father. My father was a rules guy. Uh, he was a sergeant, first mm. sergeant, so he was used to everybody listening to what he had to go. Yeah, uh, and uh, my mom was she was the oh man, nothing stunk when it come mm. to me. You know, mm -hmm. she. Uh, she felt I was their retirement bonus. Oh. I don't believe that my dad <laughs> felt that way, but but uh, at an early age, you know, I mean, we moved from Fairbanks, Alaska. We moved to uh, Florida, Miami. I, oh. I think they were cold. They went to Miami, and then uh, right before a hurricane hit down there, they they'd moved to uh, up to Massachusetts. Hmm. My uh, my mother had a sister that lived there, sister. And, my my uncle and aunt uh, lived there around Acton, around Boston. Okay. And we lived there for a little bit, but dad just never, never, that wasn't his thing, man. He was, he was an old boy from, from uh, Winchester, Virginia, kind of in the mountains. He was pretty backward. And, and he'd uh, been stationed at one time at Redstone Arsenal down in Huntsville, Alabama. He loved it there. Mm -hmm. And uh, he, he moved that way, uh, paid cash for a house, uh, kind of in the projects, Okay, you know, yeah. it was in the, in the more slummy areas of Huntsville. And, uh, that's where I, that's where I, I grew up and, and it was all for a reason. All that stuff was a true, true reason. You sure. know? Uh, so when did you start I, playing? I, I started playing of all things. I, I started learning how to play the banjo. My dad, my dad was learning how to play. And for some reason, uh, the the annoying sound of that banjo it, it perked my ears hmm. and uh and my dad knew that i was interested in it he bought an old banjo at a pawn shop and uh, but as i remember as a kid i didn't like that banjo and my mother knew it as well so when my dad would go to work i'd be about five or so my my dad would go to work and she would take his banjo and uh, sit me on the couch and put it between my legs and let me play it. Hmm. And uh, evidently, I would figure things out. Hmm. Uh, I, she would hear me like playing, like just uh, pressing down on the keys and hitting, and she could hear like tunes. Uh -huh. Like I, I was playing like little things. And, and she, she told my father that I was interested in. So around six years old, he was teaching me a song. He taught me how to play Cripple Creek. Okay. And uh, he was taking lessons from a guy, Jim Dowdy, here in town. And um, he took him and said, uh, look, uh, I know, he's, I know he's, too, he's, he's pretty young, and a banjo's pretty heavy. Okay. You know? Yeah. It's... So I was having to prop it between my legs, you know, on a, on a chair. He said, but I've learned, I've taught him how to play one song. Just listen to him. If you, if you don't think he'll teach him, you know, just, you know, just let it, you know, we'll, we'll do something else. But I played the song and my banjo teacher just, he's like, yeah, he's got something special. Uh -huh. And uh, I've since talked, I have a relationship with my old banjo teacher now. Oh, cool. and he says, he said it was amazing. He said, uh, 
I still remember, he said, I had to take all the furniture and just move it to the side. And I'd, I'd put pillows down on the floor and we'd sit on the floor and we'd lay your banjo in your lap. He said, and he said, it was amazing. He said, hmm. I was having to learn things to show you. Wow. He said, because you were just absorbing everything. And, and it was really true. I mean, it was, it, music came pretty easy and the banjo was just, I don't know. The Lord just gave me that ability to be a bit, to understand it. Yeah. I was winning contests when I was seven years old, Wow. you know, against adults and, you know, and then I, I moved on from other instruments, started playing the, the guitar. Uh, I was in a music store one day. My dad worked at Sears and uh, next to the Sears, there was a music store that he used to go to during his breaks. And my mom would take me down there. And I remember picking a mandolin out up out mm -hmm. of the, off of the wall and, and playing it. And they would have little jam sessions. And, and for some reason I, I was starting to, jam with the mandolin at the wow. first day that I picked it up. So uh, God had obviously, you know, my and my mother was more, my dad wanted me to stick playing the banjo, but my mother was like, I, God has gifted this boy. I don't, I don't know, but we need to nurture that. So mm -hmm. she was real instrumental in, in pushing my dad to do probably things that he didn't want to do <laughs> and uh, pushing me in that direction. But I, I played, you know, contests and, and won a lot of state contests, you know, th throughout until I was about 16, I got really tired of it. I'd been okay. playing for playing contests for about 10 years, made a lot of, you know, you know, dad invested a lot of that money for my education yeah. and stuff. And, but, you know, I graduated and, and uh, I was going to college and I ended up with a, a family band up around Fort Payne, Alabama that I was playing with. And, uh, and eventually, you know, did some demos uh, for a guy named Michael Purrier. Uh, one was The Missing Piece. Oh, yeah. Off your and, first uh, album. And, uh, yeah, and I uh, and that that demo got in the hands of Jeff and Sherry. And uh, Jeff and Sherry called me up and asked me if I wanted to, you know, this is, I'm, I'm progressing yeah. pretty quickly. But, well, Jeff and Sherry Easter, but, they're uh, people who know the Southern Gospel side of things recognize that name. Yeah. Right. And I, I started with them, and I was with them for about a year and a half and really got disenchanted in gospel music, just to be honest with you. I, I was out there. I, I, I saw a lot of things I don't believe, uh, you know, I should have seen. Mm. Um, just a lot of, I don't know a lot of selling of Jesus hmm. as opposed to really preaching Jesus. Uh, I, ju I just saw a lot of contrary living. Hmm. And um, in fact, it was so bad uh, and not with Jeff and Sherry. I I'm not pointing them out in particular, but, but a lot of the groups that we were with, it turned my stomach against the gospel. Really. Hmm. I, I didn't feel that, that Jesus was, <laughs> He wasn't rep. If he was being represented, he wasn't being represented well. Yeah. Um, and I, and it really turned my stomach against Christianity, against God. I, I really got angry about it. Um, and I, I ended up, uh, I, I, I decided I, I had just finished that missing piece record. Okay. Cause Jeff wanted me to do a piece of product and he'd gotten me hooked up with, uh, Benson and, uh, Norman Holland out there and they gave me a little deal and they didn't give me hardly any money to do it. It was, it was really a miserable experience mm. to do that thing. I had to do, I had to do 20 songs in three days, oh, track wow. it. And I didn't have any money to pay anybody. Mm. Yeah. I ended up having to do it all myself. So I, right when that album was finished, um, I'd pretty much gotten, I was done. Mm. And uh, I ended up going back home. I was married at the time, and I went back uh, home to Rainsville, Alabama, and I went back to work in a sock mill. I was putting my instruments under the bed, decided I was never going to play again. Mm. I, I was at it. I did. If that's what music is all about, I don't want nothing to do with it. And uh, I was building a house. I uh, got, a, got a job in a steel fabrication plant, which I was not gifted at, <laughs> but I had that job. And uh, next thing you know, I'm, I'm out hanging insulation, and uh, my wife at the time comes out uh, and, and says, uh, there's a, a Ricky Skaggs on the phone for you. Hmm. 
And I'm like, you, no, sh- your kids. Yeah. No. no. And she says, and, and she was like, I don't know who Ricky Skaggs is. She didn't know who he was. But and, you knew who he was, I'm right? Like, oh, of course I yeah. knew. I was like, you guys. Uh, and, and she said, just talk. To, it's, it, I don't know who he is. So I answered the phone, and sure enough, you could tell by that voice it was him. And he asked me, he said, I'm, we're going to be playing around Georgia somewhere. We're looking for a, a, a utility player that can sing. Uh, wonder if you'd be interested in it. And I, they sent me a bunch of stuff to learn, and, and I learned it. And I, I went to this place that they were playing and got on his bus. And, you know, he said, you play that? And I said, well, a little bit. And he said, well, pick it for me. And I played a little bit. All the instruments that way. He got yeah. Paul Brewster up on the bus. We we sang a little bit, and he said, "Well, when can you start?" Wow! And I and I that's when I first started with him. That was been like ninety five. So, what was it that caused you to pull your instrument out from under the bed again? Because you'd kind of put that away, and we're doing the blue collar thing, right? Ricky Skaggs. Because it was Ricky. Ricky Skaggs is the only reason that I pulled the instruments out of the bed because mm. they were they were under my bed, and I wasn't really going to play anymore. I just decided I wasn't going to do it. And uh, Ricky, in my story, has not come. <laughs> he's, he, he came that way to pull me out once, or God used him to pull me out once. He's done it twice. We're going to get to that part of your story, right? Yeah. Yeah. But it, it's, it's happened twice. But I, you know, I was with Ricky uh, for about a year and a half, did the Bluegrass Rules Project. We won a Grammy off of that thing. It was awesome. Yeah. Uh, I, 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 did not it bluegrass is not my forte i'm just be honest with you it's just not my i was a james taylor lover singer songwriter gotcha i wanted to i wanted to play country music i wanted to play big stages i wanted to do that thing man uh and you know i just didn't feel like i I was singing enough and i wanted to sing more and it, it was me 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 i i ain't got enough you know i'm sitting here swatting this arch top and uh so I ended up, uh, I got a job with uh, I audition for Joe Diffie. Mm-hmm. Uh, I played with Joe Diffie for about six, seven years, was his band leader. Um, you know, a lot of, lot of stories there. Uh, it introduced me to a different, <laughs> Ricky is a Christian. Right. So Very his, definitely, yeah. He, uh, and his backstage and his, uh the way he handles his business, uh, you know, it kind of keeps everybody in line. Right. If you want to stick around, everybody knows that there's a standard that you, sure. you live by there. You're just not after, you know, picking up women and, you know, and, and, and down in the bottle and, and yeah. that kind of thing. There's a, there's a standard. But when I got away from that, uh, it really allowed me to so – whatever oaks I had not sown before or felt stifled in, I was, I was given a free reign to do, and everything was free. Mm. The booze was free. The women were available. Everything was wide open. Oh, wow. And, uh, and uh, I, you know, I, I started light. I started, you know, I didn't go full fledged, but, uh, you know, life got a hold of me a little bit more. Marriage starts getting a little rocky. I'm gone all the time. Uh, things just weren't good at home. And I, I was on the road for, you know, over 250 days a year. I was right. never at home. Uh, it, I, I was not there. So I had moved from, from, from Diffie at one point to uh, Tracy Lawrence with Tracy Lawrence for a good mm-hmm. while. Uh, we, we were on tour with Diffie and, and Chestnut for a couple couple years, which was insanity. Wow. Uh, it was just, it's just everything that you, everything that you would think would be uh, available to you uh, that your flesh cries out for. You're already playing music. You're already playing in front of a bunch of people that are really – wanting to hear you and mm-hmm. admiring you and just gooing and gone over and yelling, throwing babies up in the air and wanting to be near you. Yeah. Uh, you're, you're, you're top dog. And that and, was filling uh, an empty spot inside of you. It felt great. Yeah. It, it, it felt it's everything that your flesh, 
cries out for. And uh, what I come to find, it was never enough. Uh, you never could fill it. it. It always felt good, and uh, a little more would would seemingly make you feel better. Right. But it there was, it was just one in every every city, and I I, I really don't I, I usually don't talk that much about all the all that. Right. Uh, but that's part of part. Of, you know, sin. I heard at a young age that sin will take you farther than you ever want to go, keep you longer than you ever want to stay, and cost you more than you ever want to pay. And and I always used to just balk at that, yeah. you know. And and my thing was, I was a kid that played music and played it well from a year uh, early age. Yeah. And my thing was, everybody said that boy's going to do something. Man, he's got such promise. He's man, he's got the work that he's the best. He's the best around here. Hmm. He he's going to do something. And then I'm out here on these big stages playing with these big artists, you know, and uh, making a name for myself. And then uh, my life starts going to pot. You know, my marriage starts falling apart. I, I start staying more and more. I start thinking that the grass is greener on the other side. Mm -hmm. I'm, uh, I'm, I'm drinking. Uh, I'm drinking pretty regularly. I'm partying with my friends. It feels really good. Uh, you know, it's like a weekend pass. You get out on the, out on the road. Nobody always talk about the 500 mile rule. Mm. You know, if it's 500 miles. Uh, or more, it, it never happened. Oh wow! You know, it's like going to Vegas. Yeah, <laughs> you know what 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 goes in, on in Vegas, it stays in Vegas. But went on what went on, and all these buses and all these tours wow. stayed out there. You know, and um, I look back at it now, and I realized how empty the life that was. Uh, but it felt good, mm. and that and it. <laughs> It, and it did feel good. I mean, those, those, it was fun. It was the, the, the joy of the chase, everything. Yep. But, uh, you never could get enough. You never could fill up with it. Yeah. And, yeah. um, I don't know. I, uh, I started my, my, my marriage fell apart. Uh, I was in the middle of divorce. Um, all that, all that went away. Uh, I had, I had a little boy that had just been born mm. and right when he was born is where I, right when we divorced. Oh. And, uh, and at that point, I think I, I kind of lost it. Yeah. Um, I still tried to do the things that I was doing to try to fill that hole. Um, but I, I, I just, I upped the ante a little bit more. I just drank a little bit more and I, I indulged a little bit more and I, um, I just ended up, um, really getting miserable. Wow. Yeah. But, um, so had the bottom completely dropped out at this point? I lost my job. Mm. Uh, I got fired, uh, from Tracy Lawrence, which I, I, sometimes I, I take a little bit of pride, um, uh, <laughs> that, that I did, I, you know, I got, I got fired for drinking from Tracy Lawrence and, <laughs> Those guys were pretty good drinkers, uh, so I, uh, that was that was a big blow. Yeah, um, I, I really didn't have anywhere to go. Uh, I was already starting to make a name for myself that I had a drinking problem. Uh, um, and uh, when you get that when you get that stigma over your head, you 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 become a little bit of poison. Mm. Um, I moved in with a buddy of mine. Uh, I, I got hooked up with a friend of his that I, I ended up on a, a tour. It was a, it was a, a tour for the Conway Twitty's sisters who put a, hmm. a play together about their dad. And I was on that for a while. Uh, I got, they got onto me all the time about drinking on the bus. Um, I, I ended up with Leanne Womack on my, my stage with Leanne Womack when I, when I auditioned for her, uh, that was probably one of the drunkest stages of my life. Mm. Uh, that, that whole tour, I don't remember much of. Wow. Uh, we were on the George Strait tour. And at this point, uh, I started going to jail. Even before that, I started getting pulled over and let go. 
it's amazing how those things start happening. Once you start getting pulled over, you'll continually get pulled over. Once you start going to jail, you continue, you know, for a drunk and for an alcoholic, you keep going back to jail because uh, it's the it's the repetitive nature of your mind. Uh, you, you keep thinking that I, I'm going to be able to control this thing. Yeah. I'm going to be able to change some things, but it's the, it's the definition of, of insanity, continuing to do the same thing over and over again and expecting different results. And yeah. that's what I, I lived on that for about 15 years. So, so you're obviously saying you, you had an alcohol addiction. Were you aware of it at that point? I didn't want to think. I, I was thinking at this point that I could probably stop at any time. But I, I did, I didn't want to. Mm. I, I, I was living by that old uh, Frank Sinatra adage. He says, uh, "I feel sorry for people that don't drink because when they get up in the morning, that's the best they're ever going to feel." Mm. That's that's what I felt like. Wow. I didn't trust anybody that didn't drink. Mm. It was crazy, wow. you know. Um, I, I had pushed away from church uh, completely. I didn't want to have anything to do. And that was from my early 90s experience. I just mm -hmm. got, I felt God was dead. I, I even got to a point where uh, I became, I became com convinced that I, I was pretty much leaning towards being an atheist. Mm. I, I wasn't even to the place of believing that there might be something there. I was, I was really to the point that I, I was really going to try to prove that God did not exist at mm. all. And then, that Jesus was just, it was just a fairy tale. And all these stories in the Bible that I'd heard, the Jonah and the whale and all that mess was just, it was it was nonsense. Huh. You know, yeah. animals yeah. two by two, come on, you all go crazy. <laughs> right. Uh, you know, I, in fact, I'd be around my dad and he would get so angry because I'd be so God-hating, mm. you know. Uh, and he'd just look at me and says, I believe it. You know, he'd just be very, very, but my dad and I just, didn't get along very yeah. well, even at an early age. But, but I mean, I, 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 I kept going to jail. I, I went to jail. Uh, in fact, one of the reasons that uh, I, I was that I ended up not with Leanne anymore is because I got arrested, and uh, they just didn't know what happened to me. Oh wow! And uh, as of recently, I've gotten reconnected with a few of them. And I've told them the story. Yeah. Of, of what happened. Um, but I, I became kind of dead in Nashville. Nobody knew where I was and what had happened to me. And, and th then the people that did know just said, what a waste, you know? Mm. And that, that's where you become your, your name is mud. Everything about you is, uh, anything that was good was behind you. Uh, there's no future. You were abandoned by your friends, even even the people that you'd worked with, your so-called friends. You're, yeah, they're yeah. they're gone, and and there's been people that I know um, would have reached out to me had they known where I was. Mm. And there was there were Christians that I traveled with through the years that would have been there for me had they known where I was, uh, or had they known what condition I was. I know that they would have reached out, but they weren't supposed to. Mm. You know, mm. I believe it's not by chance that they they didn't know. Uh, I, I think God was really pushing me, allowing me to, to go as far as I wanted to go. Mm. And uh, and I it, those those disastrous spots in our life that we we send ourselves to because these are all our choices. Yeah, these these bad choices lead to bad consequences. And I had warrants for my arrest because I kept running away from court. I wouldn't show up in court. I had bail bondsmen against me. I had three warrants for my arrest at one time. Wow. Wow. Uh, you talking about nightmare. I'd met this girl in Alabama. I ended up moving back to Huntsville, Alabama, come full circle right back mm -hmm. here. Yeah. And, uh, I, I was living with this, this girl out in new market. 
I, I exhausted her. To I, I didn't work. I exhausted her. She enabled me. I can imagine it, it'd be nerve wracking to constantly be looking over your shoulder because you never know who's who's after you to to get you and to bring you in. And I would I would I remember one particular night I, I fell asleep. I would always fall asleep drinking. I would drink until I passed out, and many times I'd pass out on the couch. And I I remember to her place. It got really dark, and I would. I would sleep with the uh, with the TV on, and I remember waking up uh, in the middle of of my drunk and hearing sirens and 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 looking around, and it was just the whole room was just full of blue lights, and I'm like, well, they found me, they got me, you know, and it was an episode of Cops oh. that was on the television. <laughs> yeah, it's it's the there's no rest, there's no rest in it, and. Uh, and it just got worse. Mm. Um, then I, uh, she had had enough of me. I, I moved to Atlanta with a friend of mine. My my alcoholism just kept getting worse. Then I started pawning just about everything that I had. I had my instruments and uh, any kind of musical gear that I had. Anything that I could get money mm. uh, to drink on. I, I stayed there for about six to seven months, and a friend of mine. Uh, came to visit me and I, and it ended up taking me back home uh, and let me live with her and her family. Mm. And I stayed in, I was there, I was back in Huntsville again. And I knew I could not stay there for, for, for long. Yeah. You know, I, I had to get something together and, and then at the time, that's my, when my mother died, my mother passed away. And so that was just another thing that just drove me even farther uh and then i decided i was going to leave and i and i lied to my friend and said there that i'd gotten a job on a cruise ship mm. and uh to just drop me off at the uh the greyhound station and i was i was leaving off for for the for florida and uh, i was going to be boarding a, a cruise ship and which was a lie i didn't have any kind of job but she dropped me off there and uh, I said goodbye to her, and then I became homeless. Oh, wow. So I was I was living, I was living downtown. I and I was sleeping. I'd worked my way to Costco. And I was sleeping behind Costco, and uh, just panhandling, drinking. Uh, a friend of mine, I, I I eventually called. I didn't stay behind Costco. But for a few weeks, I was there for a few weeks, but I, I had contacted a friend that I knew that didn't know what I hadn't contacted him in years, and he had a studio there in Huntsville. And he allowed me, he had a rental place that he let me stay, and I took advantage of it. It was a great opportunity for me to get my, but I could not stop drinking. Mm. I couldn't imagine not drinking. I, I didn't have any kind of drive. I didn't know. I didn't know how to get through it. I had accidents. I, I busted my head open just getting to the liquor store one night. About killed myself. Um, I and and my friend. I, I eventually uh, went back and called my friend that I'd went and lived with her family. Mm -hmm. She found out that I was back in town, and I made up a lie and said that I, I came back and I I couldn't hack it and. Not never, never, you know, the truth was a thing that I really had a hard time dealing with. There's so much lies in me. I, I felt easier telling a lie, even about things that didn't matter. I lied, hmm. you know, yeah. Uh, the truth just wasn't in me. Was that, was that a, was that a side effect of the alcohol or was that just kind of where your heart was at the time? I don't think I wanted anybody to know who I really was. Hmm. Uh, I, I, I kept myself really, really guarded. Uh, I like to blame all my problems on everybody else. It felt better that way. I could, I felt better about myself by blaming it on my father or blaming yeah. it on my, my, on my last uh, girlfriend or, you know, th they're the reason that I'm so down now. They're the reason I'm drinking. Blame it on my ex-wife. That's a good reason. You know, uh, I, there's so much me. I, nobody gave me a chance. You know, nobody... You know, poor pitiful me, yeah. and and then you're able to use that poor pitiful me as an excuse to allow other people to feel sorry for you, so that they'll enable you 
in what you're doing. Gotcha. It was like it was a it was a big game. Yeah. Everything about it was just uh, it was all how can I twist this thing to make it go for in my direction, you know? Um, but I, little did I know that this girl, uh, that I'd met, uh, Cindy, uh, she had a bluegrass band and, uh, she wanted me to play in her band cause one of her bandmates was not going to be able to fulfill the dates that she had. He was going to be going out of town. So I, I filled in for her, for this guy and did several dates with him drinking. Oh my gosh. And that, that was the exhausting part of my drinking at that point, because I'd gotten to the point at that, at that spot that I started isolating. Oh. I started really kind of staying by myself. Right. I didn't want people really know how much I was drinking, what I was drinking and that kind of level. But, and, and it was exhausting to go out because then I had to plan how much I had to take with me oh. because then I was having to take enough to be able to keep myself leveled out, not go over the line where I would go completely down, but I had to drink so much throughout the day just so I wouldn't start shaking or detoxing and stuff. And I, so I always had a backpack with me. Wow. Like that, like that's not a gi complete <laughs> giveaway. You know, I was like, here I'm, you know, always got this backpack with me. Yeah. You know, and, and, and I'm acting like, you know, I'm really pulling it out from people. Nobody really knows what's going on. Why is he, why does he keep going every 30 minutes back, you know, to the bathroom? You know, uh, even when I went to church, I took the backpack cause my, my friend Cindy started taking me to church with her and, uh, I would take the backpack to church with me and I, I would drink at, during the altar call or, wow. or you know, in, in between songs yeah. and stuff. But, you know, the cool thing is, uh, I didn't ask for it, but uh, God really brought this girl Cindy in my life, and we would go to uh, on her bluegrass dates. We would go and play in Kentucky, and I'd be in the seat next to her, and I'd be spouting all this negative God. You know, God doesn't exist, Gee, really. You know, and 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 she would quote scripture to me and 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 tell me what she and I was like, "You're an idiot," huh. you know. Yeah. You know, it just, this is complete nonsense, you know? It just, it, that that behavior kept going on, kept going on. And and uh, eventually I just kept going to church. And for some reason or another, the light bulb started maybe going off a little bit. Like maybe God does exist, you know? What, what caused that, what caused that turnaround for you? A love of people in the church. Hmm. I, 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 I had gotten so antagonistic against church. And uh, when I started going to this one particular church, it's like I was never judged. Uh, nobody, nobody looked down on me. They encouraged me. They were glad to see me. And I know, I know they knew what I was doing. Mm -hmm. uh, but yet, nobody said anything. They always welcomed me back, always seem seemingly glad to see me. And for some reason or another, that made more of an impact with me than I, I guess I realized at the time because hmm. I kept wanting to go back. But really, Cindy was the, she was the real key to me being open to the gospel. I, I could not understand how she would be able to put up with me, mm -hmm. you know. <laughs> and uh, I didn't stop drinking, of course. Um she she began to realize that I had a massive problem, um, and she would talk with me about it on occasion. But there was it, it all kind of came to a head uh, because uh, I, I told her that I had a license, but I never did. And uh, this one particular day, I was planning to go see her because we were going to play some music somewhere, and I had my dad's truck, and I don't even know why or how I even got my dad's hmm. truck. Uh, but I drove it over to her house. And uh, as I was pulling into her driveway, a truck and a trailer just come barreling right at me and uh, smashed. I could have could have killed the guy. Oh, wow. Uh, but he runs into the ditch. And then I realized I was going back to jail. There was no. And I, I had. 
I had I had five at that point that that would have been five DUIs. Wow. Yeah. Uh, and, and and when you get to that point, uh, and you've been you've been running for that long, there was one warrant I'd been had, they'd been looking for me for seven years. Uh, and I had others that were like two or three years old. I had I had one in Lebanon. I had one in Bedford County that were a couple years old. They'd been looking for me for a while. Uh, and I just knew that all that stuff was going to combine and they were going to send me down South. And so I, I went to jail, of course, and, uh, I was mad. Mm -hmm. uh, they, they denied my, my, my bail. I couldn't get bail cause of course I was a runner and yeah. I, I violated every bit of my probation cause I was on, I was on, I was on, I was on probation and, and walked away from it. So I had all these issues and stuff. And um, I don't know, just for some reason or another, my, my friend Cindy got with the, the pastor and a, and a Sunday school teacher, and, and uh, they, they, they got a plan. You know, mm. what are we going to do about this derelict, you know, Dennis? And, I, you know, of course, I don't know. I'm not able to talk to anybody at this point. Yeah. And uh, next thing you know... Uh, I'm going to court and um, I get put on uh, work release. I, I, I get, I, I plead guilty. Uh, I get, I, somebody pays bond for me because I had another charge that was at a later date that I was going to have to answer to. So they had to post bond for me. Somebody posted bond for me. I don't know who it was. It wasn't my family. Wow. That they posted bonds so I'd be able to go on work release. I wasn't even court ordered to go on work release, but somehow I was able to go on work release. And then during this time, the only person I was able to talk to was Cindy. So I'd uh, and 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 she would be telling me stuff like, uh, "Dennis, God God loves you." I I was looking for sympathy. Mm -hmm. I wanted somebody to feel sorry for me. You know, I wanted somebody to just feel bad for me. I. I wanted to waller in self pity and shame and stuff, and she just wasn't going to have anything to do with it. And she just, but I just remember clearly her just tell me specific things. God loves you. Yeah. God has a plan for your life, and and God uses the broken to prove His power. Yeah. And I still remember that. And and I'm like, I remember hanging up the phone thinking that's the biggest nonsense I've ever heard in my life. It's just, you know, she told me at one point that I need to get a Bible and I need to draw near to God and because God was drawing near to me. He had a plan for me. And I'm like, hey, yeah. are you, are you, are we at the same place? Yeah. You know? Yeah. Do you know where I'm at? There's no hope there. And, uh, but I did get a Bible. And I started reading it, but nothing was really clicking at the time. But I uh, I got on a kiosk one day, and I decided I wanted to get out of the cell I was in. And the only option I had was to go to an AA meeting. Mm. So when I got out of this AA meeting, or when I when I got out of my cell, I, the first AA meeting I was taken to, I mean, you know, I mean, they've got me in shackles and all. I'm, yeah. I'm walking down this hallway, and, and they open this doorway, and I look down. I look down the end of this this hall, and, and there's a guy I know. Huh. I, I used to go to church with him years ago, and he was one of the guys that came with this AA bunch. Ah. He had the biggest smile on his face. It was like he was really happy to see me. Very cool. And I was embarrassed, you yeah. know. And I go up to the front, and he comes over and hugs my neck and just, you know, says, I, I am so happy to see you. Wow. My, my gosh. And in the course of this meeting, I started hearing these guys. There was three of them that got up, and they were basically telling their story of what alcoholism had done to mm -hmm. them, you know, and what, 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 what path they'd gone to, what depths of, you know, what their problem, you know, what the messes they created. Yeah. And what God ended up doing in their life to clean up their mess. And I'm like, some of these stories were way beyond what I could ever imagine even thinking of cleaning up, uh, you know? Yeah. And I'm like, but at this point, I'm still not to the point of really realizing 
or understanding that I was an alcoholic. I hadn't come to that place. Mm. So I, I left and they, they, they came back every two weeks. And I remember that next AA meeting that I went to, same bunch came there and there was this guy there and he told his story and he talked about being in this recliner and, uh, he, he talked about how his wife always wanted him to go places with her and, uh, you know, wanting him to go to church or wanting to go out to dinner with her. And, uh, right. they'd been married for all these years and, and, and all he wanted to do was just sit in his recliner and drink, just leave me alone, just leave me alone. And he said, then one day she packed her bags and she left. And he said, it took that mm. to allow me to realize that I chose that bottle and that alcohol. Right. I chose that drink over my family. And the thing is, I hurt her. Uh. And that was the thing that really got me hard is that I thought all my pain, I was hurting, but I thought I was only hurting myself. Right. I really thought that I was, I wanted to die. I wanted to kill myself. I wanted me to go away. I didn't see any future. So what's the sense of doing anything? I, I, I'm done. Mm -hmm. So I was trying to kill myself the only way I knew how. Coward's way by just drinking to myself. But when I heard him tell his story, it made me realize all the people that I had hurt. Wow. My father, my mother, who didn't get to see her son mm -hmm. sober. Getting, she, that woman prayed for me every day of her life. Disappointed my sister, my coworkers, everybody, everybody that I'd made a mess. And I'm looking at this now saying, how in the world am I going to clean that mess up? Yeah. yeah. And I got back. I got back to the cell that night. And that was the first, my first instance of really realizing I was an alcoholic. And I, we had about 10 minutes before I had to be, on lockdown we had access to phones and I went over to the phone and I called my friend Cindy and I remember telling her I said uh, Cindy I'm not gonna drink anymore Wow and I am so sorry for what I've done I've hurt you and I'm so sorry and uh, I'm just not I'm not gonna do that anymore and I I remember crying out to God and it's basically step one. I'm powerless against alcohol. Yeah. And it all starts. Every bit of it starts with repentance. I realized that I had a need and a need that I could not supply. I, w I tried to stop drinking before and I, I, I failed every time. And my alcoholism was just a good representation of my sin. It was something that yeah. I had absolutely no answer for. I could not pay it. Yep. I was dead. And uh, and I went back to my childhood, and I realized that Jesus was the answer to my sin problem. And not only was he an answer to my sin problem, he was the answer for me to stop drinking. And... Uh, and that was the day I got new life. Wow. Very cool. And uh, I just kept going to those meetings. I keep going to those meetings, but I, I, I tend to those. I, I ended up getting a sponsor through the guys that had come to that jail. The guy that was the guy that met me there at AA, he's told me since. He said, Dennis, he said, you don't realize this, but that was going to be my last night going to that particular jail. He said, because I, I'd seen no results. I'd been going there for two years. Wow. I'd seen nothing. And he said, I told the guy that night, he said, this is my last night. I ain't got going. He said, and then you showed up. <laughs> and said, then I realized I was there to get you. Yeah. God sent me there to get you. And and he was so charged up about that. The ways and reason we was so happy was he just kind of, he just, he was shaking his head at God like, Oh God, you're so good. Yeah. You're so good. You know? Oh man. It's just he he's the one that picked me up from jail and 
And uh, he picked me up straight from jail at, at like one thirty in the morning. They, yeah. they they let us out at after midnight. He picked me up and didn't take me anywhere but straight to an AA meeting. <laughs> and we sat there till an AA meeting started at eight o'clock in the morning. And it was it was just now it's time to get to work. Yeah. And so uh, I ended up. I mean, God supplied a place for me to live. I still live at that same spot. Huh. Uh, I, it's where this blasted air conditioner is. Yeah. You know, I remember walking into it thinking that that's the biggest eyesore in my life. <laughs> and, it's been, and, and God used the biggest eyesore that I ever seen to become one of the, one of the blessings in my life. Yeah. Hey, I got sober under this air conditioner and I also got to share what God had done for me under this air conditioner and be able to share it on Facebook. Yeah. It's been powerful what God can do with something if you just surrender it to him. Yeah. You know, and humble yourself. Oh, man. Don't, we're nothing. You know, for so many so many of my years, I've thought I was something. And I thought my worth was in playing music. And it's in singing. And it took alcoholism to drive me absolutely to the bottom. And then I started working at a Thai restaurant, washing dishes on on work release and I found I found where my worth was mm. and it wasn't in music everybody used to tell me you're you're good for nothing but picking yeah. you ain't good for nothing and that's what you think your identity is and my my call to Christians these days is your identity is not what you do it's that that stuff is just filthy rags mm. everything yeah. your identity is in the blood of Jesus that's it. Yep. I am in nothing but Christ alone. And it, it changed my life. It, it, you know, if I, because your your ability could be taken at any time. I've seen musicians lose arms, lose you know, get ill and uh, lose their voice and, and all that kind of stuff. And man, I lost it all. I stopped playing completely, and I found that even when I wasn't playing, I was the happiest. I'd ever been because I, I, I found new life. Yeah. I was born again. Yeah. That old guy's dead. Yeah. That guy that used to, you know, that kept doing the same things over and over and over and over and over again, kept getting, getting arrested over and over again. That guy died about four and a half, five years ago. Yeah. Well, the thing that's exciting to me about your story is, understanding how God is pursuing us and all of the, this is the last time I'm coming to this jail for AA this, uh, Oh, you know, I, all of these people that God put in your life waiting for you to be receptive. And, and yet it was, there was always somebody there. I had no, I had no idea. I, and I've told people I'd love to take some credit for some of this goodness that I, I clung a hold of this guy because I like this guy or I clung a, no, these people were absolutely specifically placed in my life. Yeah. I started going to this particular church. I started going to this particular guy's Sunday school class. He was a, he was a three-star general. He knew someone at the jail that allowed me to get on to work release. The work release allowed me to pay my fines, allowed me to get a little bit of money ahead, and, and, and so I would, when I did get out, I'd have a place to be able to get started. And, uh, and all these, all these specific people, uh, uh, my friend, Chris, that I saw in AA, he, he introduced me to his friend, which is my sponsor now that I would not be sober had not been for that guy. And this guy did not tell me stuff that I wanted to hear. I've tried to fire him for the last four and a half years of being my sponsor. But but you can't fire somebody from telling you the truth. Yeah, You just can't. Once you get along with yourself and you say, you know, you can't escape the truth. You may, you may not like it. You may hate the truth. You may try to run from it, but that doesn't keep it from being the truth. Right. And uh, I had, I've had such stinky way of thinking. I, I there was a episode of Seinfeld years ago that I remember. George started doing everything opposite of what he 
normally did and everything started working out for him <laughs> that's basically what i did first six eight months when i was sober mm. and uh and i was about nine months sober i i i still hadn't got my license i was scared to get my license because mm -hmm. i still had stuff that had to be taken care of mm. that i didn't want to take care of mm -hmm. and this this is how god does me too is he knew that i was going to be antsy about everything that i was going to have to be pushed and he's going to have to put other people in my life. And that's what he did. Yeah. I Nine months, I was still riding a bicycle back and forth to meetings. I get a call coming out of an AA meeting from Ricky Skaggs. Hey, what are you doing? I need you to come. I never thought I'd play again. Yeah. I was, never thought. I, I was fine with just washing dishes. And I went to my sponsor. I went to Keith. I said, man, you think I should take it? He said, Dennis, you're a musician. Of course you're supposed to play music. Of course, of course God put you on Ricky's heart. Of course, this is not Ricky. This is God. You go where God calls you. I said, well, how in the world am I going to do it? He said, we'll figure it out. Yeah. You know, God will make a plan. If he wants you there in Nashville, he'll make, I said, I don't even have a license. Well, we need to work about getting your license. And I didn't <laughs> want to talk about that. You know, I didn't want to talk about that. Yeah. So I rode a Greyhound for two years just back and forth from Huntsville to Nashville. Wow. And my, the banjo player would pick me up. And then one day I was sitting with Ricky and I, I just got honest with him. I told him, I can't go to, I can't, I can't get into Canada, man. Can't do it. I got warrants. I, I don't, I didn't tell him about the warrants. Uh. I told him, I said, man, I've got, I've got, I've got DUIs that I, I, they won't allow me into. And Ricky's such a good guy, yeah. a wholesome He's never hired anybody that's a derelict like me. He never had to worry about people that had warrants for their arrest. He didn't know anything about it. Yeah. So I'm like, I can't, I can't go. And so for the first trip they did to Canada, I didn't go with him. And then uh, next thing you know, <laughs> at the beginning of the year, he goes off to Washington D.C. and he he said this guy he's put you know he went to the National Day of Prayer. Uh huh. And he's and he's putting his mandolin up. He he went up there and, and sang some songs at the at the National Day of Prayer. And so this guy comes up to him and says, uh, "Hey, Mr. Skaggs, I really appreciate your stand for the Lord. Uh, if I can do anything for you, be any help to you, let me let me know." Yeah. Uh, and he says, uh, "What's your name?" He says, "I'm Robert Adderholt. I'm district districts. I forget what our district. I think it was District Six. Alabama. He said, "Wait a minute. What? 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 What's in your district? Is it Huntsville, Coleman, Gunnersville? Hey, wait a minute. My guitar player has got some issues. Do you think you could maybe talk to him about? He needs to get his license. He needs to get his passport. He needs to. He needs some help just getting over." And he said, "I will do anything I possibly can." Wow. And one day I was sitting in Georgia. And I was going and visiting Cindy. Yeah. And I got a phone call, and Ricky called me up. He said, Dennis, be honest. He said, I think I found somebody that might could help us. Wow. He said, but you have to be honest. You have to tell the truth. You have to put it all out there. You got to trust. Yeah. You got to trust me. You got to trust, you got to trust the Lord. You got to, you know. And I told that man everything I did. I told him I, I had warrants for my arrest. I told him that I had fines I had to pay. I was scared. I told him. Look, God has done this, and God has put you here. I, if I have to go back to jail, I will go back to jail. I, I, I don't want any kind of leniency. I want to, I want to get this behind me. Yeah. And he said, "Well, we don't want you to have to go back to jail. Let's, let's see what we need to do." And uh, he got a, he got a lawyer help, had me, helped me get a lawyer that was uh, around this area. And basically, all these people wanted was their money, uh -huh. and uh, and God provided me to be able to work, that I could pay all these fines off. Next thing you know, I got my license back. I I, I got, and then I I decided I was going to shoot for the moon, and I was going to try to get into Canada. So I had to, I had to, I had to fill out a bunch of paperwork to try to get a permit yep. to get it, and that happened. Wow! It, it every bit of Every bit of whatever I did, the bad choices, 
God allowed me to clean up the massive mess that I made. And he continually shows me over and over again. I just stand in awe of like, why yeah. are you that interested in me? Yeah. But it ain't just me, brother. He's interested in you. Yes. He's interested in all of us. Yeah. He and he's 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 like running after us. Yeah. You know, we, we think somehow that that we've left God behind, but he is aggressively yeah. chasing after us. Amen. Ricky does a song called Can't Shake Jesus. It's the truth. I and I didn't realize it. My eyes weren't open. But when my eyes were opened up, I see now as I look back how God was there yeah. the whole time. Yeah. Every every bit of it as as I was in agony, he was right there. He never left. Yeah. He was he was just drawing me and it was just he knew how stubborn I was. And why is it that we as people have to exhaust every bit of what we think yeah. before coming to God? Yeah. We do, though. People don't come to God because they don't want to come to God because they love their sin. Yeah. I just got into the place where I realized what my sin had done. And uh, I don't want to go back to that way of life. Yeah. I don't want, I don't want, you know, I. it's not that I'm not tempted. I. It's a, It's weird how the mind works on you. I was at a gas station not too long ago, and I'm sitting there pumping, and why is it? that my eyes always are directed toward the those neon lights of a liquor store. Mm-hmm. And, I, and my mind gets to racing like nobody would know. Yeah, You know, you could just have a day off. But thank God, I'm not supposed to promote AA, but I go to AA because I get, I get hope. I, I, I get to hang around a bunch of, bunch of guys that have been through the ringer just like I – yeah. And they're honest about their problems and they're honest about their struggle. And why is it that we as people are habitually f- forgetting? Yeah. We, we, the, the folks that, that drop out of church, they don't just drop out of church and, and still live the Christian life. When you're away from the flock and you're away from your friends and you're away from your Christian brothers, you're just doing what you want to do. Yeah. And you start forgetting what God did for you. Yeah. You know, I, I, when I read through the Old Testament, I, I hear, you know, put this marker here so that you remember what I did, what I did. And I will always forget what God did if if I don't keep going back. I go back to the same, I still hang around the same messed up people that have been redeemed, that remind me of my spiritual condition. Remind me that, you know, why is it that I call him with all my problems? And the first thing that comes out of my sponsor's mouth is, did you pray about it? <laughs> well, no. Yeah. That, that's a good start. You know, those yeah. kind of people yeah. that point you straight to the cross. Yeah. Man, that's the kind of people I have found. And why is it that God has protected me? And brought those people in my life and somehow all the derelicts in my life that I, I hung to that I thought were my best friends that were going down the tubes with me. I was listening to them. They were listening to me, a, a group of people with a bunch of bad ideas. Why are those people not in my life anymore? Because God's mercy. Yes. God, somehow, even when I try to go back there, he puts a roadblock up. No, uh, no, you're not. No, <laughs> call this guy. Yeah, he's put he's put godly people in my life. They're they're of value, man. We are the hands and the feet of Jesus, man. We're all called to do his his work, and this is how we got to edify each other and love yeah. on each other and lift each other up. That's the way. That's the way he's designed this thing. Yeah. I'm a. I need an eyeball and a foot and an arm and, a, and an elbow and a joint and a wrist. We're all working together. Yeah. Nobody's more important than the other. Yeah. And, and I, I, I see it in my field and I always have. And in music, people like to put you on a big old pedestal and make you out like you're somebody. But, buddy, they ain't nothing about me that's good. 
Anything that's good about Dennis is something that Jesus did. Yeah. Glorify him, lift him up, and every one of God's people has a, a, has a glorious piece of service. Yeah, you know, I sing, whoop de do. You know, people edify, people cook. Gosh, people, people, people smile. I yeah. wish I smiled more. <laughs> people, people, people outside of myself really know how to love. And that love comes from Jesus. Yeah. I want to start smelling like Jesus. You and I have had a couple of times to chat a little bit. One of the things that I've been very aware of as we've talked is how this isn't just a story for you. This is a life change for you. And I would bet you I, that you are paying this forward, investing in other people with love now because you felt the love of God in your life. I have, uh, I have empathy. For, for those that are suffering. I get it. Uh, I also understand more and more. Um, I, I did have a period of my life where I was really trying, you know, why is it that when you're really trying, you get really judgmental of others? Hmm. And it, cause for me, and I know, I know what a fool I am. I, I I'm, I'm extremely aware of my sinful condition. But when Dennis starts trying, Dennis expects everyone else to try too. <laughs> and that's, and that's just not the way it is. And the, the beauty of the program that, that I uh, live in and God's word that coincide, it's all the same is that I'm responsible for me, mm. you know, and God's working on me. And God doesn't need my help to fix you. Right. God can fix you and get your attention way better. And uh, I, 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 have, I have learned that the best thing I can do is clean my side of the street up, stop passing judgment on everybody else, and stop acting like, you know, you got to start getting together. Why is it that people that exercise – more than me are freaks hmm. and people that exercise less than me need to get it together. You know, <laughs> I am full of selfishness and self-righteousness and I'm always trying to point out the failures and others to take the less light off of my own self. But there is so much in me that's wrong. Yeah. And, and God whittle away at me, whittle away at my heart, you know, change me into what you're, you called to be more like Christ. Yeah. I, I, I found that just in this week of working with my family. It's like there's a there's something beautiful of of Jesus on the cross being spit and uh, mm. and cursed and him saying, Forgive them. Yeah. They don't know what they're doing. Yeah. And that's the thing. You 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 see people living the way that they live and and, and the world the way it is and everybody passing judgment and everybody's got an answer and you and, and know and, and Christians are are being ridiculed for their faith and we're getting angry mm -hmm. Christians are getting angry don't get angry just just do what Jesus said what did he say he said love them love them yep you ain't, you know I, there's a difference between love and liking mm -hmm. I don't have to like it right but I do have to love them yep Yep, and I'm uh, I, I I really I don't see how Jesus did it. I, I it, it's it's I stand in awe of reading through the New Testament and see how he handled every situation and and I'm supposed to be like that. The Spirit of God lives within and is changing me to be like that. And where I don't I don't have that judgmental spirit. Man, he hung around prostitutes. Mm -hmm. He hung around drunks. Mm -hmm. and those are the people that he loved on. Yeah. You know, he loved, you know, he was, he was angry at the religious leaders. <laughs> yeah. he, was, he was ticked off and, 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 and more point, I mean, and then just directly angry at, at the, the self-righteous. Yeah. The, the, the folks that knew they were sinners. That's the one he loves. He loves when you know you're a sinner.
you're so close to him because that's all he wants. Yeah. He just wants your sin. Yeah. Just get give your sin to him. That's what he wants. He paid for it. He paid a full price for it. Yeah. If he paid for it and bought it, it's his. It's not ours anymore. We should let go of it, huh? <laughs> and that's it. Yeah. That's 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 pure freedom. I want folks to know that he saved me, but I have really seen his power in being able to sustain me. When I came out of jail, I didn't have a place to live. I, I really didn't know if I had a job. And and my friend Chris, just one day, just I was standing outside uh, of the Thai Garden where I was on work release, and he said, who is this God you say you trust? That's all he said. And that just hit me. Well, all right. If you, if, if you're real, he will provide God provides for his own. And I don't, I can't even tell you how all that happened, but it happened when it was supposed to happen. And in my mind, things are supposed to go quickly. Mm -hmm. God's timing though is, God's timing, yeah. and it, and it and it's not our timing, and it could be really, it could be misconstrued as, man, God's late, but He's never late. He's always on time, and I can tell you from personal experience in my life, God's timing is perfect. Yeah. And you'll sit back and say, Whew, man, that is not any way I would have done it. Everything that has happened in my life. Even from the making of this project that I did, the songs under the air condition, I knew I was supposed to do these songs, but I wouldn't have done them the way I did them. Yeah. I wouldn't have involved Banjo Ben. I wouldn't have went over to I wouldn't have told my story. If it had been up to me, I would have had 13 or 14 songs on it, and I would have scrapped it because mm. I would have listened to it back and said, "This nobody's going to get this. They don't understand it. But I knew I was supposed to do it. But God gave me the information when I could handle it and when it was time for me to handle it. And he involved the right people mm -hmm. to direct me. And I know it was him. The thing I love about this project of yours is so many um, albums out now are just simply, here's the songs, go listen to it. But you tell your story before each one of them of how this song was important in the foundation of who you are in Jesus. And I just love that. Well, and, and that started only because I started singing under this air conditioner. Mm -hmm. One day I was sitting here with an iPad, the friend had given me, and I, and I had it propped up, and I didn't want to forget something. I had a musical idea, and I had it on video, and the, and the, the camera was, you know, was turned around back at me, and I saw me and my guitar and that air conditioner, and I thought it was funny. Yeah. I didn't see any kind of biblical, you know, spiritual perspective of it. I had an idea. I, did, I believe it was the Lord directing me to do it. You know, you need to sing some songs, and you need to put them on Facebook. And I, I most of the songs weren't even gospel songs. Right. A lot of them are country songs, but most of them were about life. But I did share my life. I yeah. told my story. When I was getting sober, I was telling people about it. Yeah. That's what we're supposed to do, brother. Yeah. We're supposed to tell our story every day in, in the workplace. You know, if you're not talking about Jesus every day, and, and and he's weaved into your conversations. I don't know how much you know him. Yeah. Because I mean, it's just it's it goes on with the territory, man. There's not a day goes by that I'm not this fanatic. Well, I'm a little more fanatical about Jesus. I didn't want to be this guy, you know. But if you're becoming who God's making you, you're going to be different. You're going to yeah, be different. I, I, I couldn't stand the the fanatical Christian people, but. God has done such a work in my life. I, how can you, how can you not give him credit for what he's done? Yeah, he has to get credit. I have to tell people about him. Yeah. yeah. So where can people find find these songs from under the air conditioner? Where can people find that if they're interested? Well, my friend Banjo Ben, it's uh, Banjo Ben Clark. Uh, dot com. Uh, go to his store, and you can look up. Songs under the air condition. He's selling. He sent. He's selling the physical copy. You can get a CD through him um, or through me at PO Box four sixty four, Huntsville, Alabama three five eight zero four. 
you can write me or hit me up on Facebook, Facebook Messenger. Uh, I can I can hand it out, but you can get it through uh, Amazon, uh, iTunes, wherever to download stuff. Yeah, and I encourage anybody who has you've got to go listen to it. It's a great album. Just you and your guitar singing and telling your story, and it's very very. I enjoyed it immensely, and uh, I encourage people to listen from the beginning all the way to the end because it really is a it's a story from death to life. Mm -hmm. It really is. One of the things that we do through my webpage is every every uh, Saturday I send out a prayer newsletter saying, "Hey, here's some artists. Let's pray for these guys today. How can we pray for you in the up in the upcoming weeks as you're going through your stuff? What can we pray specifically for you?" Well, uh, I've been having uh, some opportunities to be able to go and share at, at certain churches, you know, music is, is, is just kind of shut down. Right. Um, like right now, I, I mean, I'm kind of out of work. Um, I've been looking after my family. You can pray for my sister and my family. Uh, and that I would be the, I don't know, the right spokesperson in our family to really share Jesus with folks. And, but, uh, just that we be, I, I just, I just pray that, that God would give me opportunity to be able to share and, um, and that I would be faithful. Wasn't that amazing? I just, I just want to sit and let that story soak in for a while. What a great reminder of how God is pursuing us to be in a relationship with him. And I appreciate the reminder that we have the opportunity or, dare I even say, the responsibility to be in a relationship with each other. God used Dennis's friend Cindy and Chris and Keith to speak love into his life. God used a church family who accepted him just as he was, warts and all. Now, Dennis's story really strikes to the core of what I hope this podcast will be about, an encouragement to get into relationships with each other, to spend time sharing and caring and loving each other in spite of the messiness of life, and a reminder that God really is crazy about us, longing to draw us into a relationship with him. We talked a bit about Dennis's new album, Songs Under the Air Conditioning Unit, and I really recommend that you go listen to that album. In fact, I'll put the links to that album in the show notes so you can easily find it. I just, I just have this feeling that Dennis's story and his music is going to be meaningful to a lot of people. So would you mind sharing this podcast with people who you think should hear his story? And you might help spread the word by liking this podcast on your favorite podcast app. Uh, and a review would be great, too. This podcast is a sister project to the Christian Music Archive, where we are documenting the albums we love and the people who made them. Head over to thechristianmusicarchive.com to learn more about Dennis Parker and other artists like him. This podcast is also made possible through the generous support of listeners like you. And you can head over to patreon.com slash ccmexchange to learn how you can support us and maybe even hear these episodes before they're released to the general public. As always, I'm grateful that you took some time to spend with me this week. If you enjoyed this conversation, would you let me know? You can drop me an email at christianmusicarchive.com slash podcast. There's a link over there in the right-hand side where you can send me a note. Or, if you prefer, you can reach out to me on our social sites. You'll find me by searching at CCM Exchange on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Well, thanks for spending your time with Dennis and me today. Be sure to check back next week when I've got another great conversation with another artist that you can find here on the Christian Music Archive website. So until next Wednesday, remember that God loves you. In fact, he's crazy about you. <laughs>